Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're tackling something uh, really fundamental for everyone working in the endoscopy suite, mm. especially you know our endoscopy nurses and technicians. We're taking a deep dive into biliary and pancreatic anatomy and um, the common pathologies you actually see during ERCP. Endoscopic retrograde chalangiopancreatography, yeah. It's complex, but seeing it visually helps so much. Absolutely. And for this deep dive, we're actually leaning on some uh, great material generated by Notebook LM, which itself was based on Dr. Raju's video for the 2025 ASGE Endoscopy Tech course. So it's really tailored content. Exactly. Laser focused on the practical side, what you need to know for your day to day. Our mission really is to give you a clear understanding um, of what you're actually looking at on that fluoroscopy monitor. Yeah, absolutely. Because when that contrast goes in during an ERCP, it lights everything up, doesn't it? The biliary system, the pancreatic system. It's a little roadmap. Exactly, a roadmap. Yeah. And being able to read that map, seeing the normal structures, spotting when something looks, well, off that's where your skill really enhances the whole team's performance. Right. You can anticipate this. You can anticipate. You're ahead of the game. You know what the endoscopist might need next. It's invaluable. Okay, so let's get into that roadmap then. Starting with the biliary system, that uh, network that moves the bile around, where does it all begin? What's the route? Well, um, the journey starts in the liver. That's where the bile is actually produced. Okay. From there, it flows into these tiny little ducts within the liver, the intrahepatic ducts. They all start merging, getting bigger, and eventually form the main right and left hepatic ducts. So two main branches coming out of the liver. Correct. And then those two join together at a really important point called the confluence of the hepatic ducts. For the confluence. Think of it like a major highway junction. You know, if there's a problem there, a blockage or something, it backs everything up. Makes sense. Big consequences. Huge. So after that confluence, the single duct carrying bile away from the liver is called the common hepatic duct. Got it. Liver, intrahepatic ducts, right and left hepatic ducts join at the confluence, mm -hmm. then the common hepatic duct. So what happens next? This must be where the gallbladder gets involved. Precisely. The gallbladder, our little bile storage sac, connects to that common hepatic duct through its own duct, the cystic duct. Ah, oh, the cystic duct. Right. So if bile isn't needed for digestion right away, it travels up the cystic duct into the gallbladder to be stored. Concentrated, ready to go. That's a reservoir. Exactly. A reserve tank. Then, when your body needs bile, say after a meal, the gallbladder contracts, squeezes the bile out. Okay, so it gets the signal, contracts, and then where does the bile go? It flows back down the cystic duct, and then it joins up with the common hepatic duct again. Okay. And from that meeting point onwards, the duct is now called the common bile duct. Ah, okay. So common hepatic plus cystic equals common bile duct. You got it. And that common bile duct travels down towards the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. Right. And it finally empties the bile out at a specific spot called the major ampulla. The major ampulla. Okay. So, path is yeah. liver, biliary, maybe gallbladder, via cystic duct, common, common bile duct, duodenum at the major ampulla. That's the basic flow. Okay. Pretty clear. Now, let's switch gears slightly to its neighbor, the pancreas, also crucial for digestion. Where does that sit? And what are the key parts we should recognize on the flora screen? The pancreas is kind of tucked away, isn't it? It sits behind the stomach. Right, posterior. Yeah, and its head is nestled right into that C-shaped curve of the duodenum, that C-loop you hear about. Okay, so the head's in the C-loop. Mm -hmm. Anatomically, we divide it into the head, the body which stretches across behind the stomach, and then the tail, which points towards the spleen. Head, body, tail. Got it. There's also one other little bit, the uncinate process. It's like a little hook extending from the head, sort of deeper, more posterior, near the lower parts of the duodenum. Okay. Uncinied process. Good to remember. What about the ducts inside the pancreas? How do those digestive enzymes get out? So there are two main ducts, typically. The big one is the main pancreatic duct. It runs pretty much the whole length of the pancreas from tail to head. Right. And usually it joins up with the very end of the common bile duct just before they both empty into the duodenum through that same major ampulla we mentioned. Ah, so they often share a common exit point. Very often, yes. Then there's usually a smaller duct, the minor pancreatic duct or duct of Santorini. Sometimes it connects to the main duct, sometimes it just ends blindly. If it drains separately, it does so through the minor ampulla, which is just a little bit above the major one. Okay. Main duct usually joins the bile duct at the major ampulla, and sometimes a separate minor duct at the minor ampulla. Understood. 
that's the normal setup. Perfect. So now that we have the uh, the normal anatomy down, let's talk about when things go wrong. The common biliary problems we might actually see during an ERCP. Let's start with um, biliary colic. Pretty common, right? What's happening there? Biliary colic, yeah. That's usually a gallstone causing a temporary blockage of the cystic duct. The duct from the gallbladder. Exactly. If the stone just sits in the gallbladder, often no symptoms, but if it moves into the cystic duct and blocks it, even for a short while, that causes that characteristic pain. Right, that sudden, often intense pain. Mm -hmm. But the key is transient. The blockage clears itself. That's why typically you don't see inflammation or fever or jaundice with simple biliary colic, just the pain that comes and goes. Okay, the temporary jam in the cystic duct. But what if that stone doesn't move? What if it gets properly stuck? That sounds like it could become, well, more serious, like cholecystitis. That's exactly right. Cholecystitis inflammation of the gallbladder usually happens when a gallstone gets firmly lodged in the cystic duct. Now it's a persistent blockage. Okay, so it's not clearing. Right. Bile can't get out. The gallbladder gets inflamed. It can swell up with fluid, get infected. And in really bad cases, the tissue can die, become gangrenous. Oof. Sounds painful. Oh, it is. Much more prolonged, severe pain than colic, often with a fever, too. But importantly, because the blockage is usually just the cystic duct, the main bile duct, the common bile duct, is still open. Ah, so bile can still drain from the liver. Exactly. So typically no jaundice with cholecystitis. Okay, persistent cystic duct block, inflammation, fever, bad pain, but usually no jaundice. Now, mm -hmm. what if the stone gets past the cystic duct, but then gets stuck further down the line, in the common bile duct itself. That's cholecystitis, isn't it? Precisely, cholecystitis. Stone in the common bile duct. Now you have a blockage after the point where bile from the liver joins in. So now the liver drainage is affected. Correct. Bile backs up into the liver. This causes liver enzyme levels in the blood to go up. Okay, so elevated LFTs. Elevated LFTs, yes. Patients might still have that biliary colic type pain. And when you do imaging ultrasound, MRI, or during the ERCP itself, the bile duct above the blockage will often look dilated, widened. Because of the back pressure. Exactly. And sometimes you can even see the stone itself on the imaging. So dilated duct, elevated liver enzymes, those are your big clues for a common bile duct stone. Definitely red flags on the monitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about uh, an even trickier situation? When a stone blocks the very end where both the bile duct and the pancreatic duct are trying to empty out biliary pancreatitis, right? Yes, that's biliary pancreatitis. Oh. The gallstone gets stuck right at the ampulla of vatter blocking both exits. Double trouble. Big trouble. Because now you've blocked bile drainage and pancreatic juice drainage. Oh. So you get severe pain, you get the elevated liver enzymes because the bile duct is blocked. Right. And you get elevated pancreatic enzymes, amylase and lipase because the pancreas is blocked and potentially getting inflamed. And you might still see that dilated bile duct too. You might, yes. It's a really serious condition. Needs urgent attention. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, shifting gears again slightly. Let's think post-surgery. Gallbladder removal, cholecystectomy, is super common. What kind of biliary issues can pop up after that surgery that we might see during an ERCP? Good question. Post-cholecystectomy complications are something we definitely look for. Bile leaks are one possibility. Weeks. Where from? Well, the most common place is the cystic duct stump, where they clipped or tied off the cystic duct. Sometimes that closure isn't perfect. Okay. Or uh, during the surgery, one of the hepatic ducts could have been accidentally injured. Less commonly, there might be a leak from something called an aberrant duct of Lushka, a small extra duct that drains part of the liver directly near the gallbladder bed. Never heard of that one. Lushka. Yeah. Not textbook anatomy always, but they exist. And rarely, the main right hepatic duct could be injured. So during ERCP, if you suspect a leak, you inject contrast. Exactly. You inject the dye, and if there's a leak, you'll see it spilling out of the normal duct system. Contrast extravasation, we call it. You see it pooling where it shouldn't be. A clear visual sign. What about narrowings or strictures after gallbladder surgery? Yeah, post cholecystectomy biliary strictures can happen too. Often it's the common hepatic duct that gets injured, maybe by heat from the cautery device used during surgery. Ah, uh, thermal injury. Right. That injury heals with scar tissue, and the scar tissue contracts, causing a narrowing, a stricture. Okay. And it's not just surgery that causes strictures, is it? There are other causes, too. Oh, absolutely. Bile duct strictures can be caused by cancers in that area. 
Pancreatic head cancer is a big one because the bile duct runs right through it. Right. We saw that anatomy earlier. Also, cancer of the bile duct itself, cholangiocarcinoma, or Hiller cancer, right up at the confluence. So malignancy is a major concern with strictures. Definitely. Another cause, non-cancerous but still serious, is primary sclerosing cholangitis, or PSC. It's an inflammatory disease that causes multiple strictures throughout the bile ducts. So seeing a stricture on the fluoro, it could be post-surgical scarring, or it could be something much more ominous like cancer or PSC. Exactly. That's why ERCP with brushing or biopsies is often needed to figure out the cause of a stricture. Critical distinction. Okay, let's move finally to chronic pancreatitis. What does that look like inside the pancreas, duct-wise, during an ERCP? Chronic pancreatitis involves long-term inflammation and scarring fibrosis of the pancreas itself. Okay. This really messes up the pancreatic duct system. You often see the main pancreatic duct becoming irregular with areas of narrowing or strictures. Similar to bile duct strictures, but in the pancreas. Yes, and because the pancreatic juice flow is slowed down by these strictures, stones can actually form within the pancreatic duct, often upstream of the narrowings. Pancreatic stones, okay. You might see those on the fluoro. Also, the duct can become weakened and leak pancreatic juice, which can collect and form a pseudocyst, basically a walled off collection of fluid next to the pancreas. Wow, so irregular duct, strictures, stones inside, maybe pseudocysts nearby. That's the picture. That's the classic picture of chronic pancreatitis changes in the duct, yes. But remember where the pancreas lives. Right, neighbors with the bile duct and duodenum. Exactly. So chronic pancreatitis can cause secondary problems. That inflammation and scarring in the head of the pancreas it can squeeze the common bile duct running through it. Causing a bile duct stricture? Causing a bile duct stricture, exactly. Same process can sometimes affect the duodenum, causing a duodenal stricture. Makes sense, just from proximity and inflammation. Mm -hmm. And another one, the splenic vein runs right behind the pancreas. Chronic inflammation can sometimes lead to a clot forming in that vein, splenic vein thrombosis. And why is that significant? Because splenic vein thrombosis can cause increased pressure in the veins draining the stomach, leading to gastric varices. Ah, enlarged veins in the stomach that can bleed. Potentially, yes. So you see, chronic pancreatitis isn't just about the pancreas. It has these potential knock-on effects. That really highlights how interconnected everything is down there. Bile duct stricture duodenal stricture, even stomach viruses potentially, all linked back to chronic pancreatitis. It's all tightly packed, and understanding these links is key for them in the endo room. It helps anticipate what the endoscopist might find or need to address. Absolutely. Okay, so let's do a quick recap. We've traced bile from the liver, maybe via the gallbladder, down the common bile duct to the duodenum, and pancreatic juice through its ducts to the same area. Mm -hmm. We've looked at biliary colic, mm -hmm. temporary block, cholecystitis, persistent cystic duct block, cholecystitis, common bile duct stone, and biliary pancreatitis, and pula block. Right, plus the post-cholecystectomy issues like leaks and strictures. And other causes of strictures like cancers or PSC. And finally, chronic pancreatitis, the damaged duct, stones, pseudocysts, and those secondary complications affecting the bile duct, duodenum, and splenic vein. And the whole point really was connecting these conditions to what you might actually see on the fluoroscopy monitor during the ERCP. Exactly. Seeing that dilated duct or the contrast leaking out or that narrowed irregular pancreatic duct with stones recognizing those patterns. That visual interpretation is such a crucial part of your role as endoscopy nurses and technicians. It really helps the procedure flow smoothly and effectively. Couldn't agree more. Your eyes on that screen are incredibly valuable. So maybe a, a final thought to leave everyone with as they're watching that flora screen next time. Given how closely linked the biliary and pancreatic systems are, what subtle little changes, maybe easily overlooked signs on that screen, might actually hint at something more complex going on underneath that needs a closer look? That's a great question. It's often those subtle details combined with the clinical picture that guide the next steps. Constant vigilance and pattern recognition are key. Absolutely. Well, thanks for joining us for this deep dive today. Hopefully this clarifies some of what you're seeing in the endo suite. 